So, dobry wieczór, good, after, good afternoon, good evening, actually. It's so nice to see so many faces, both familiar and unfamiliar. And uh, as you perhaps are aware, we've gathered here to listen to the lecture uh, by Hert Loving, uh, entitled Extinction Internet, which is also the title of his uh, recent essay and the forthcoming publication. Um, before I uh, say a few words about uh, Hertz's uh, background, uh, I also would like to officially thanks, uh, thank all the institutions and collectives who were engaged in securing uh, Hertz's visit in Krakow, above all uh, the Central Public Library in Krakow that hosts today's event, uh, the Intermedia Department at the Faculty of uh, at the uh, Fine Arts Academy uh, in Krakow, uh, Department of uh, Performance Studies at the Jagiellonian University, which is where I work, uh, the Excellence Initiative at the Jagiellonian University, Scena Supernova, and the 366 Foundation. We have a, quite a bit of a program that stretched throughout the upcoming two days as well, but today we will focus on uh, Hertz's uh, recent uh, research. Hertz Loving is an internet critic, a uh, critical media scholar, and I guess above all the theorist of tactical media, the theorizations of which secured for our guests a place in the pantheon of critical thinking on the turn of the 20th and the 21st century, even though a pantheon is maybe not a space that our guests ever desired to occupy, as far as I'm concerned. Rather, he always aligned himself with the underdogs, and this is a quote from our conversation from earlier today. Um, and this led uh, Hertz, among many uh, circles, to the uh, critical media theorists and practitioners who, uh, back in the 1990s, were still exploring the potentialities of the internet architecture that was coming together and of course already back then it was in many ways exploited by uh, the states and uh, other people who held a substantial amount of power although the 90s was still uh, a time when this coming architecture of today's internet offered certain promises of emancipatory autonomous social practice and hurt was basically one of these people who take time to write the history of ongoing critical media theory and practice and to also set uh, certain trajectories and pathways uh, for the future. In 2005, when the <laughs> contemporary and much less forgiving, I would say, architecture of the platform, platform internet, internet. As, as we, we know, know it today, today uh, Hertz has argued that, that networking, networking presents certain political, political counter-hegemonic counter promises when it is understood in terms of not networking. So introducing noise into the seamless, uh, fluid data streams, um, which uh, are valued above all by the agents of, uh, cap of the capitalist economy. And these sort of interruptions, as Hert argued, except for or besides introducing noise to these seamless data streams, they also create certain positive externalities that allow social practice to thrive and new forms of sociality to come together. A substantial amount of time has passed since 2005, and I guess this optimist streak in Hertz theory practice has also won a bit. And his recent publications and projects are concerned precisely with how to develop a certain mental economy for, the, for what is coming and this what, this indeterminate architecture of the future cyberspace is still something that does not have its proper name, although we might term it post-internet perhaps, but this word is already charged 
uh, with many meanings introduced in the last 10 years, especially by artists, often aligned with the agents of hegemonic capitalist culture. So Hert prefers to call this possibility of a future internet in a rather pessimistic way on the one hand, but also full of potentialities, uh, the extension internet. And I won't intervene into the subject that Hert is going to speak about today, this evening. So without further ado, I give way to Hert Loving and after uh, his lecture, this is just one note, we will have, I think, an ample amount of time to discuss uh, the lecture and all these potentialities Hertz is going to uh, talk good. about together. So in case you have any questions, yeah. please write them down um, and let's hope for a round, round table moment in some 45, maybe 50 minutes. Thanks. I would like to give the microphone to you. Um, because uh, before I start, uh, I want to have a little conversation, uh, you know, because uh, we prepared uh, my visit, uh, the three of us, um, but uh, tonight, uh, you know, and I'm very, very thankful that you uh, came here, but I'm here for three days, so um, there's today, tonight, but also um, you know, there's activities uh, tomorrow and uh, on Wednesday. And there's also possibilities for you to come and attend uh, uh, some of that. And some of them will be, uh, let's say, a bit more wild, uh, you know, in terms of with music, uh, DJ and so on, right? So, uh, unfortunately, tonight, uh, yeah, there is no uh, music which is uh, sad, uh, maybe. <laughs> I don't know, but... Uh, but uh, um, so, uh, I have uh, three days to uh, uh, present my w work here, Rom, and uh, maybe you can say something uh, a little bit more about the, the program for tomorrow and for Wednesday. Yes, uh, and uh, there is, I think, it is uh, very important to say that there is... Uh, one more uh, partner of uh, our uh, meeting on, on, on this um, project. Uh, I hope something what we start and we will develop for a long time is Ukraina TV. Yeah. And people here from Ukraina TV, like Diana, like Gleps, especially, exactly. who is really. Uh, that was, uh, in fact, the this. reason why I came. And uh, uh, this yeah. is, in a way, the reason <laughs> that uh, you are here, that we start to talk about, uh, like, um, spring of this year and uh, establish uh, daily uh, contact. And uh, tomorrow afternoon, after 3 o'clock, uh, you are welcome in the studio, Ukraina TV Stream Art Studio in Berka. And you, they know the address, right? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, so it's a Ukraina is, uh, TV. Huh? The address is not there, but yeah. uh, the uh, address Wednesday, is... Uh, Wednesday, uh, yeah. yeah. Wednesday, uh, Stena Supernova. Tomorrow, uh, I hope uh, we will have uh, kind of the a really uh, working uh, evening and afternoon uh, mm -hmm. with workshop with partners and also hybrid uh, connections with uh, different uh, people and uh, artists and uh, mm -hmm. organization uh, around the world, uh, especially dedicated to uh, long-term collaboration in hybrid way in uh, intersection between uh, uh, new media, new possibilities uh, that the infrastructure still, I hope, gives to us. And in the same time, uh, in context of uh, war in Ukraine, uh, invasion of yeah. Russia in Ukraine, and also this geopolitical context uh, of uh, searching for some uh, tools to be together, to create a new so solidarity, um, activities uh, and form yeah, so of that, being that together. Is, that's tomorrow um, and on that's Wednesday, what, what time Wednesday, does it start? Uh, I think, uh, I hope there will be also MEM uh, workshops uh, that yeah, you propose meme, uh, uh, follow, uh, for example, this uh, MEM reader, uh, which is uh, part of your activity and I was very glad to also to open uh, our attention to this kind of uh, activities yeah. and uh, this uh, day, this afternoon and evening is much more uh, 
uh, dedicated to students, uh, PhD candidates, uh, people who want to establish uh, contact with you also as kind of your mentor because you are a very important person for uh, young people and uh, inspiring. I think this is yeah, the term. Uh, yes. And uh, yeah, I never and, uh, work with important I, I people. That's, uh, I, uh, I, I avoid important to both sides. <laughs> yeah, and also uh, yeah, um, and hope uh, there will be music also tomorrow. Yeah. Will be music too, uh, okay. in late afternoon, evening. Uh, some rehearsals and some yeah. recordings and some experimentation uh, with your text. I hope, and after tomorrow we have uh, more stage. Uh, and uh, design uh, setup and uh, some experimentation together. So uh, I think that day after day, hour after hour, will be more and more friendly with. Uh, that's a, a complicated setup uh, of uh, people, machines, data, and uh, uh, fun, and also very serious investigation <laughs> in some intersection of uh, topics. Yeah. Um, so uh, tomorrow and Wednesday, I'm also open. If you want to meet me, if you want to uh, talk about your your work, if you want to present something to me, uh, I'm uh, available, and we can make an appointment and then have a meeting. So I often do that. Uh, so we can talk for half an hour or um, how, how long you you like. So this is why I came to Krakow to meet you. So this is the purpose of my visit. Uh, to uh, work uh, with you. Uh, so if you uh, want, uh, if you have a research or questions or uh, if you want to present something or talk about uh, collaboration, for instance, it's also a possibility, maybe you know, we have an Institute of Network Cultures in Amsterdam uh, and you can have an internship there. You can arrange that through the Erasmus or not. It doesn't really matter. Uh, of course, there's a problem that you then have to live for some months in Amsterdam, and uh, that is a, that's a, that's a problem. I know uh, because uh, you know it's it's crazy uh, expensive uh, there. The internship is only 400 uh, euros, so uh, you know it's not so much uh, money. But we want to invite you uh, to come uh, and work uh, with us if you uh, think you know that you you are interested, um, uh, so this is uh, an invitation. Maybe uh, one last thing, uh, maybe can you open the door, because otherwise we will all at some point fall asleep. Yep, thank you. <laughs> all right, um, let's roll. Um, all right, um, I um, am going to uh, present here first of all uh, the latest book that just came out um, uh, stuck on the platform. I know there's already uh, another text which is even more urgent uh, called uh, Can You Leave the Door Open? Yeah. Um, uh, to, uh, which is called uh, Extinction Internet. Um, uh, but I will come back to that and uh, there's enough time in the coming three days uh, to discuss that. Uh, here you can see the table of content of the new book. And it's the book uh, that uh, uh, kind of reflects the last uh, three years. Oh, did somebody close the door again? Uh, um, and uh, the book uh, really deals with uh, the internet cultures uh, in uh, the period 19, uh, 20, and 21. Um, and, of course, that's the period of uh, Trump, Brexit, uh, but also COVID, right? And so uh, the book, uh, for instance, opened with, uh, with an uh, essay about uh, uh, Zoom fatigue. Maybe you remember Zoom. Uh, uh, you, we have all been on, uh, on Zoom. And, um, uh, yeah, we all switched off our um, web cameras and uh, we were hiding uh, behind uh, the uh, the computer, uh, so uh, so the, the 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 essay, for instance, deals with um, the question of um, you know what Zoom fatigue is and um, uh, what it means when you have to spend many many hours in the, and uh, there is no real uh, response or feedback, right? Uh, and um, so, uh, but also the 
the book uh, deals with uh, you know the mental uh, uh, questions of uh, um, and uh, in the in the performances that I will give uh, uh, tomorrow and on Wednesday, I will uh, go further uh, into this question uh, of the relation between the platform economy, the behavioral uh, uh, psychology and the manipulations uh, of the mental states, especially of the young people. And the question how, let's say, the depression and sadness and anger and um, regression, um, uh, how this uh, relates uh, to, uh, let's say, the software, the algorithms, uh, you know, that uh, further manipulate us in, in, in this uh, sense, right? So in the last couple of years, I have uh, particularly focused uh, on, the, on this question of, uh, of the, let's say, the digital despair. And uh, the slides uh, that you see here uh, kind of reflect a little bit uh, uh, on that, right? I have many more shows like this, so if you come um, uh, tomorrow and um, on Wednesday, uh, there's many, many more uh, of uh, all this uh, depression uh, <laughs> that uh, that we can discuss. However, um, you know, it's it's a bit of a question. Uh, you know, uh, is the acknowledgement, the recognition, and the discussion about these mental states in itself leading to political organization? Le does it lead to uh, you know, new forms of uh, subversion, of self-organization, of uh, of counterculture, and yeah, this is something uh, I want to discuss with you. And for me, this is um, uh, still a, a little bit of a question. To not acknowledge it uh, is not a possibility. However, uh, to acknowledge it um, uh, in itself uh, is maybe not. Uh, per se, uh, leading to uh, you know uh, alternatives. Uh, so, uh, my in my work uh, over the last uh, 20, 30 years, I've always tried to combine, in, you know, a critique with the development of alternatives. Right. So, critique and development and and alternatives were always very very close, but. Um, Lately, in the last couple of years, uh, you know, I've seen that um, uh, maybe there is more critique, but not more alternatives, and so this is this is a problem, and that's why the, the book is also called right stuck on the platform. Uh, so there is not really a, a further development of the medium in the, in the sense that maybe we saw in the in the 90s or the early 2000s, you know, remember the last uh, mass exodus um, of millions and millions of users was when people suddenly abandoned MySpace and all moved really in a couple of weeks or even less, uh, you know, a few months maximum. Uh, millions and millions of people, uh, they, uh, they really uh, had enough of MySpace and all moved uh, onto fa Facebook, right? Which was uh, at the time quite a remarkable uh, thing to see that such an exodus uh, was possible. Now this exodus uh, is no longer happening, right? Even now, uh, with uh, with Twitter imploding, uh, we we see some activities and some people moving to Mastodon. Uh, I don't know how, how many of you are. Uh, how many are already on Mastodon? How many? One, two, three, four. Yeah. So uh, you can see that um, that uh, so somehow the, the 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 crisis that is happening on on Twitter, for instance, is not automatically leading to a mass movement uh, elsewhere, right? And so this is what I mean with uh, with stuck on the platform. Okay. So uh, I will now read uh, two fragments. Uh, one is dealing uh, with this question of the mental state. 
the the question of uh, the despair and the, the 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 depression, and then I move to the other question, namely the question of the platforms. What is a platform, and uh, you know how how can we um, uh, develop a, a kind of a critical platform um, theory? Mm? And I'm very very happy that you are here uh, with the class of Conrad from the, the media theory uh, class. So I, I especially do this uh, for you because uh, yeah, it's a, a real honor uh, that I can speak uh, to your class. Okay, let's start with the first part, stuck on the platform. Let's dive into social media weariness, the cause of our tired eyes. What are the techniques of resignation that we are exposed to? The blissful ignorance after browsing an entire ecosystem of narratives is not surprising. Culture is a pendulum and the pendulum is swaying. The organized optimism hard-coded in online advertisements and other forms of algorithmic advice turned out to be merely producing anxiety. As Carolyn Coles Richard stated, what can't be cured must be endured. The suffering, sorrow, and misery is getting tagged and filtered by our own self-censorship. We've been captured and feel frozen. What we receive is the anger and anxiety of the online other. The growing imbalance in the distribution of digital enchantment is neither causing a revolution or revolt, nor does it fade out. During the 2021 lockdown misere, we've literally been stuck on the platform. What happens when your home office starts to feel like a call center and you're too tired to close down Facebook? How to get rid of your phone? Wrong answers only. We wanted to move on and use the pandemic, remember, as a reset, but failed. The comfort of the same old proved too strong. Instead of a radical techno imagination that is focused on the rollout of alternatives, we got distracted by fake news, cancel culture, and cyber warfare. Condemned to doom scrolling, we suffered from an oversaturation of cringe memes, conspiracy theories, and the never ending barrage of COVID 19 factoids and statistics, including conflicting interpretations and senseless comments. Random is fun. In my book, which is the seventh volume of my Internet Culture Chronicles, we are staying with the trouble called Internet and continue to dig deeper into the current stagnation phase while also asking how to unstuck and de-platform the platforms. As you and I are not able to resolve platform dependency, we remain glued to the same old channels, furious at others about our own inability to change. So stuck on the platform starts with the confession. Maybe you know it. Much like step one from Alcoholics Anonymous which has a 12-step program, by the way. So, and what, what is their step one? I quote from Alcoholic Anonymous. We admitted 
we were powerless, that our lives have become unmanageable, right? So it starts with the recognition hmm, that we are stuck on the platform. <laughs> so that's kind of, you know, without that, it, it is quite difficult uh, to, to move on uh, further. Once we're locked in, the path to infinity has been blocked. Instead, we're caught in a Truman Show-like repetition of the perpetual now. Uh, and that's the domination, of course, of the real-time timeline, right? Which, uh, you know, uh, when you uh, are into it, uh, you, a few minutes, you also always have to go back to it because there's already a lot of new stuff coming in, right? So that is the perpetual now. Toiling around in the micro mess of online others that try to do their best, masking their failures and despair like everyone else. The Italian theorist Franco Berardi observes the mental state of today's students. I quote, I see them from my window, lonely, watching the screens of their smartphones, nervously rushing to classes, sadly going back to their expensive rooms that their family are renting for them. I feel their gloom. I feel the aggressiveness latent in their depression. In the social media era, the Oblomov position uh, of doing nothing and just hanging around or something like that is no longer an option. In particular, for those that cannot economically get for afford to get stuck in the abyss. The design is elegantly forcing us to engage, make choices, click, agree, and respond. If only we were capable of taking action and making decisions. Uh, so this is the problem of the, the social media design, right? There's never a moment designed to make decisions. Do you want to go on? Do you want to delete my app? Uh, do you want to make a, a real decision in, this, in, the, in the classic sense? No. Uh, the app will only endlessly continue, right? So you're uh, caught in that uh, environment. If only we were capable of taking action and making decisions. We experience the sadness of online existentialism minus the absurdity. If only Robert Faller, maybe you know him, an Austrian theorist, uh, and this idea of interpassivity was ever really implemented in code instead of being yet another Austrian idea, right? We would indulge in a permanent state of indolent apathy. And it's very important here to understand that interactivity is still the dominant mode, right? Constantly we need to do something. We're required to keep the machine we, uh, going. And the machine asks this from us. We need to swipe, we need to scroll, we need to agree, we need to uh, say yes or no, uh, and so on and so on, all the time, right? And with each click, with each movement, we are uh, adding uh, to uh, what uh, the machine uh, knows uh, of us, right? And so this is the, the dominance uh, of the interactivity um, the paradigm, you know, which, uh, Faller, I, I, I want to explain that, at the time, 20 years ago, kind of contrasted with some kind of uh, still romantic idea of interpassivity, uh, which uh, Zizek then later on also wrote about. You know, it's, it's kind of an interpassivity maybe of the old time um, television. But then the television uh, without, uh, let's say, uh, the remote control. Right? So if you just put away the remote control 
uh, then you you can uh, maybe also maybe when you're watching a film, you know, for 90 minutes, you're just caught into it and you have to just uh, deal with it, right? So this is kind of a an idea of inter uh, passivity, and uh, and of course there are also artworks that uh, that promote that, and then uh, again. There are also other artworks, usually you know, uh, called new media artworks, that require some input of you, you know? uh, which is uh, then the interactive works. We, the streaming egos, scroll and swipe, obsessed with self-creation, uh, because we create ourselves on, in the end, not just only by uploading the, the selfies, but uh, you know, every time we do something, we we further enhance our profile. Right? Facebook, the sociological constant of our time, equals the unbearable lightness of nothing. Surrounded by this massive bubble of light matter, we literally see no alternative options, no multiverses for you. Jailed in the digital monad, your freedom, you're free to dream about as many worlds as you like. Being on social, as the Italians call it, and the Italians love to speak about being on social. Are you on social? Uh, right? It means, uh, do you participate? Uh, did you read your, uh, you know, social media apps? So being on social, hmm? uh, the Zen status of detachment. It has become an ontological impossibility. We're never really lurking. Our presence is always noted. And we can therefore never truly enjoy the secretive wire status. Interaction is our tragic existence. Instead, we're constantly asked to upgrade, fill in forms, and rank our taxi drivers. Okay, I'll uh, stop here with the with this uh, part uh, of uh, of the book, which uh, kind of explains kind of this feeling of uh, being stuck on the platform, on from uh, maybe a, a more subjective uh, perspective of the user. And I want to now f uh, f uh, focus a bit more on on the um, on the platform theory uh, part. Okay, so in my 2019 book, uh, which was called "Sad by Design," uh, which uh, stuck on the platform, is somehow I consider you know as a follow-up of this book, right? So this is a follow-up of uh, the, the book that. I personally like most. I don't know if you know it really matters as an author to say, but uh, yeah, I'm sad by design. I find personally my best book, but maybe also because I made a lot of uh, personal uh, reflections in that book, and I really felt I made a jump, even though it was uh, you know quite a dark time uh, at the time. Uh, so. In my 2019 book, Sad by Design, I've drawn a speculative map of three overlapping terms. And they are important in my life too, in my own biography. Media, network, and platform. Right? Media, network, and platform. And they are related. Right? And these three terms, media, network, and platform, uh, can be put under an umbrella of an even larger term, which is called the stack. Right. So while uh, media defined the post-war, uh, you know, World War II period, and the network paradigm this described, uh, you know, the post-Berlin Wall uh, period of the 90s, we now live under the sign of the platform. For Michel Foucault, the hospital, the asylum, and the prison symbolized, you know, disciplinary society. Remember that term, right? Disciplinary society. However, 
Today's institution of self-containment are no doubt the social media platforms. So if Michel Foucault would have been alive, you know, he would have made uh, the relation between the social media and the prison or the factory or the hospital or, you know, the asylum eh? and see it as, as, a, as a kind of a neoliberal follow-up of these institutions. But obviously they are not institutions anymore with a wall, with a regime, right? So the, the disciplinary uh, aspect of it works in a very, very different way. It, it, funny enough, it works through the method of self-expression, right? So self-expression then becomes the new disciplinary form. Uh, and of course, you know, with the data extraction happening in the background, uh, the, the self-expression is done uh, in order to create more, more data. And more data means more profit, more advertisement, but also more control from the state and so on. Okay, so in another sense, uh, everything has changed, right? Because we're no longer living in the 19th century with its disciplinary uh, institutions. So these uh, social technical architectures have replaced uh, these institutions, challenging conventional form of self-mastery and control. The key question is now how to unravel this architecture, how to take part in, in social media so that, in Foucault's word, the obscured political violence within them would be unmasked, right? This is what uh, he uh, saw that was uh, his task, unmasking the hidden poli political violence. My aim here is not to uncover uh, the weak disciplinary form of social media. Uh, after all, distraction is not an escape from discipline. What's so comforting uh, about being on the platform, I ask myself. To explore its allure, I have compared platform with the two earlier and broader terms si significant in my own biography, namely the question of the media, the media question, and the question of the network. And, uh, uh, you know, what are the networks uh, today? So in both daily uh, and scholarly language, the terms media and network and platform have in fact become interchangeable. So you can hear people talking about all three of them, mixing them up, right? So it, it has become kind of one blurry environment. Hmm? Whereas television, newspapers and smartphones are easily and identifiable as distinct material uh, carriers, the social media, for instance, blur all these boundaries into one fuzzy online experience. Or, you know, to put it in today's lingo, we share media on platforms through networks. Right? So and here you see in one sentence how, uh, how we combine uh, the two. In this social media age, the dream of many students is to start their own platform, right? So here we have a, another kind of uh, idea, right? So it's, it becomes a culture ideal, uh, to use the German term, right? So it's something that we all thrive for, right? So you go to uh, your university and classes and, and so on, you know, with this uh, maybe uh, in the back of your mind. So this widely spread ideal already presumes an entrepreneurial aspiration many are not even aware of. Platform has become a, a kind of attractive meta concept, a flexible container filled with promises and dreams. This isn't just about followers, it's a mindset, an aspirational building project. Forget scarcity. Get ready and boost your platform ability. Competition is for suckers, 
Uh, so this is very important. So if you uh, the, the the ideal of the platform is that you can overcome competition, right? Only suckers who who are losers compete inside an existing platform, right? And and that's what is very very clear. And every message that comes from Silicon Valley, uh, you know, tells us. Hmm? You shouldn't be on platforms, right? Because platforms is for suckers, for losers. The only, uh, the, the only, if you want to become a winner, you have to own the platform. Okay? So the crumbs are for losers further down the food chain. This is the neoliberal version of the 1980s demand. We do not uh, wait to get a piece of the cake. We want to own the whole bloody bakery, All right? So how did the platform potential become such a desired object, All right? Because that's what it still is. We're not uh, disgusted by it. In fact, we are still appealed by a secret desire that we could once uh, own a platform ourselves and overcome this uh, uh, real danger that we become a precarious worker inside one of those platforms. So the dream is to ride the speculative wave and be where the money is made. Turning the dream into reality means owning the notes and exchanges. This is how artists, designers, and geeks envision reaching their audiences, while meanwhile becoming rich and famous. Why strive to become an influencer when you could also become the owner? Welcome to the platform fetishism, where social relationships are defined by the value created in social interaction itself. In this, in this outgoing neoliberal age, the prime directive is to look down on the poor suckers that can only buy and sell. Right? So this is very important mind change of mindset. Don't start to buy and sell, right? Because that's for suckers. The trick here is to pursue others to play according to the rules that you, the owner, aka designer of the market sets. The platform a priori is the widespread belief in the goodness of sharing. While users are encouraged to share their profiles, comments, preferences, and likes, they are kept in the dark that they share not just with their friends and family, but primarily with third parties, right? Invisible third parties that we have no idea about. Hmm? None of this seems to hamper uh, the rise and rise of the platform. Uh, so this is a, this is a problem. In the last, uh, let's say, five to seven years, uh, we started to get, to get a better understanding uh, of the platform uh, logic, especially not just while well, starting a long time ago with Edward Snowden, uh, but, but then, of course, Cambridge Analytica uh, was a, an important um, uh, moment, and then a lot of revelations by people who left uh, Google, Facebook, Amazon, etc. early uh, and mid-2017. Uh, so, so ever since that time, which is now you know, a good five years ago, we start to understand a little bit more of the inner workings of the, of the platforms. However, uh, you know, there's not, it, the information is not very widespread. Uh, I mean, there's only... One, maybe, uh, you know, a more popular, widespread, uh, known book uh, about this, uh, written by Zuzana Zuboff, uh, Surveillance uh, Capitalism. And this is probably the only uh, kind of work that, uh, you know, more people know about. And she explains there in detail how, uh, how this value creation uh, on the platform accelerates into an enormous... Uh, kind of money-making machine where within months' uh, time uh, you, you, you literally create, you know, billions and billions 
of euros or dollars or whatever uh, of value, right? So how how does that uh, mechanism exactly works? So uh, there's not so much known uh, about it, but you know scholars are really uh, keeping up and trying to uh, get a better understanding of uh, of the inner workings of the platform. Still, uh, as I said, the the platform is still a culture ideal. Uh, it's um, um, so none of this seems to hamper the rise and rise of the platform. The plat the promise of the platform is simple and alluring. Everyone benefits from producers and uh, customers to founders, right? So it's this kind of promise of of an in, in, in eternal hyper growth, right? And ex, uh, in which uh, everybody somehow seems to benefit, right? Uh, so that is the uh, allure. And that is uh, the, the way uh, the platform has become uh, this uh, culture ideal. Um, long uh, ago, this lodging, uh, uh, you know, the website, can you remember the, the idea of the website, because in the past, of course, everybody wanted to have a website, but yeah, what does that mean today? Nothing, right? Uh, then it was become, uh, then it was the blog, uh, and then uh, through the web design, uh, you know, the, the web, uh, uh, the design studio at some point, uh, you know, uh, turned in uh, to uh, a startup model. At the same time, the ballooning social media definition established itself. Social media apps enlarged to include stories, short-term videos, live streaming, shopping, uh, and, uh, and, and this all into a single app, right? So it's not about an ecosystem of apps or something like that. No, uh, the platform uh, has to include all these functionalities in, in itself. Right, so single single apps expanded to feature platforms inside platforms, uh, and this is what uh, what we we mean when we say uh, the platforms are eating the world. Uh, so this is uh, an unprecedented form of centralization and monopolization that uh, is happening, and that is happening, of course, much to the surprise and disappointment of uh, earlier uh, you know, pioneers like me and, and so many others uh, who were already around in the 1990s and who thought that the internet architecture itself of the decentralized network would prevent something like this from happening. No, it was not prevented, right? Um, uh, so, uh, and we are still in the process of understanding why the decentralized logic, uh, you know, uh, was incapable of uh, happening of, of this uh, centralized platforms to to occur, right? And we need to somehow understand that logic. Otherwise, you know, it, it will uh, uh, repeat itself uh, time and again. Platforms always come back to capital. There's a longing to harness value instead of losing ourselves in the messiness of the rhizomatic network. The platform dream has further consolidated the venture capital mode that seeks hyper growth in the shortest amount of time, setting its sight on the unicorn market domination and the monopoly situation. Hmm? Uh, so th those people who are uh, kind of preaching market uh, economies uh, uh, cannot really deal with this uh, platform situation, right? Because the, the aim of the platform is to eliminate markets, right? And while at the same time facilitating the markets under the, the platform, right? So this is the, this is the problem. Uh, if, if only there were a thousand platforms, yeah, we wouldn't sit here. There wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't, all right? But that's not the case. Um, the platforms uh, have this logic in it to eliminate uh, competitors and create uh, monopoly 
situation, right? And that's why we then end up with billionaires like Elon Musk and so many others, right? That then uh, start to uh, repeat <laughs> the logic, uh, uh, you know, that uh, was creating these billionaires uh, to start with. Mm -hmm. So with uh, very few, only very few uh, will become billionaires, however, uh, so the lottery aspect of the ruthless um, Darwinist strategy still attracts many. Uh, it's hegemonic, as they say. Uh, and uh, despite all the scandals, um, uh, Elon Musk's appeal has not yet uh, faded. Right? The celebrity status is such that the pop critique of capitalism will not really question the right to become a billionaire. We all want to run our own platform, regardless of what we are longing for. So platforms create proprietary marketplaces, connectors of supply and demand that bear little, if any, cost of production, yet are rarely neutral. They are not mere service providers, right? So that was the uh, original idea, that they would provide a service. In many cases, the platforms themselves are also significant players in these markets. Uh, and this is, a, this is the problem. If you go on Google, Google will inevitably, uh, first and foremost, create, uh, promote Google itself, right? And, uh, and, and Brussels uh, gets upset uh, by this. But this is the inherent logic uh, of the platform. So, uh, and this is why platforms are becoming uh, so big, because in a way they are <laughs> uh, they are promoting, uh, you know, in in the last instance uh, themselves. Mm -hmm. So revenue-wise, the, uh, these are adverti advertising um, uh, giants rather than technology companies, right? So one of the ways to uh, critique uh, Facebook, Google, etc., is to point out that they are not uh, generating new technologies. No, they don't, right? What they are, are they are the 21st century advertising companies, basically. Hmm? Right? In, in a way that we haven't really known before, because these com advertising companies did not really exist. Right? Uh, companies would go to an ad agency, and the ad agency would say, okay, you do a, a television campaign, you do uh, some advertisement in a magazine, right? and this was all based on campaigns around new products. Right? So the ad agencies were playing an important role, and they still do, uh, in a way. If you uh, look at Nigel and Kennedy or or the other big advertising companies, they still, uh, you know, are significant. But if you look at their revenue, they are tiny, tiny, tiny compared to uh, you know the Googles and Facebook uh, and Apples, of course, uh, of this uh, of this world. So think of the road congestion and air pollution caused by all those Uber taxis that are just idling, right? So this is a, this is a, a, a problem of the, of the monopoly. Consider the environmental impact of a million e-commerce packages that are being delivered rather than purchasing them all at once in your nearby mall or shopping street, right? So the core of the capitalist rationale re remains socializing costs while privatizing benefits and profits under the, the banner of personal choice and convenience. Unintended consequences are a feature, not a bug. So what, there was never such a thing as a, the passage to the platform. Right? How did we ever get here? And this is what we are asking ourselves. How the hell did we get in the situation we are uh, facing uh, right now? The ideology of creative destruction and disruption may be properly deconstructed by now. Yet, the overnight m migration of millions of users to, uh, to different apps 
still remains a mystery, right? How to do that? How can people um, uh, be, become motivated, you know, to to move on? In a way, we forgot about that. This is a, a, a cultural mystery of our time. Can the, can the herd swell so suddenly? Can social contagion spread that fast? The fact is, ever since uh, their arrival in the early 2010s, platforms simply are, right? And this is what I'm trying to uh, at least uh, make us aware of. The internet itself is rarely mentioned anymore. And this uh, sentence, uh, I, I expanded uh, more in, in my new lecture, uh, you know, Extinction uh, Internet. So why don't we uh, talk anymore about the internet? Uh, and why has the platform uh, taken over uh, that role? Uh, in a way, uh, I was reminded by um, uh, m my sister uh, who... Um, around to, uh, 10 years ago said, I no longer use uh, internet, I use Google, right? And I thought this was a very, very honest uh, statement. Mm? Uh, so, um, and in a way, uh, this is now a, a general condition. We no longer use the internet, we use platforms, right? Uh, so, um, and th this makes uh, the... the the discussion about alternative internet architectures also so difficult and in a way so marginal because you know who has any idea uh, anymore what the internet exactly uh, is or is all about who is in charge anyway you know what, what what is going on there internet has become part of the infrastructure uh, internet has become invisible it's always there it's always on and um, you only sense it maybe, uh, you know, if, uh, if the Wi-Fi uh, drops out or, uh, but then even then, uh, you know, maybe you'll, you'll be able to, to reconnect, reconnect uh, in another way. Like electricity, the platform is infrastructure that is always there on call and available. So the message, the platform is the message. Yeah, so we could say in, um, in variation uh, of um, uh, Marshall McLuhan. Uh, content in the, is tired, platform is wired. And um, according to the Canadian scholar, Mark Steinberg, who wrote the book, um, The Platform Economy, which I can highly recommend, uh, it's a book about the birth of the platform idea, uh, surprisingly, uh, in the 1990s uh, in Japan. So he has uh, traced, you know, where where this uh, this all uh, comes from, and uh, he uh, came to uh, this point uh, already in the 1990s uh, in in Japan, particularly because of the interplay between the telecom uh, providers. Uh, the mobile phone uh, developers and the content uh, developers that uh, were used on those platforms, right? So this is an interesting uh, kind of new form of, uh, you know, platform archaeology, if you like, if there, if there is such a thing. Anyway, um, so it's a very good book um, uh, by Mark Steinberg. And... He explains that platforms have become universal translation devices. They are the place, he says, where money, people, and commodities meet and transaction happens. So he sees them as some kind of abstract mega nodes. Almost anything can become a platform, which is kind of a strange idea. If only we, uh, you know, we call it as such. Uh, so there's also a, a kind of a semantic uh, element happening here. Uh, anything can become a platform. Mm? Um, so we move away from the framing. Maybe you remember that uh, earlier term of new media uh, with its emph emphasis on static archives and databases towards a more frenetic mode 
of never-ending, ever-changing feeds and pages, right? So my generation was still uh, obsessed with the idea of the database, for instance, and the archive, right? We saw new media as kind of a, a top layer that was ultimately feeding the archives, right, and the databases. But in social media, that's no longer relevant, right? It becomes um, a, a never-ending, uh, a changing environment that is never really, uh, that's metamorphosizing so fast that it never uh, is able to archive uh, itself, right? Um, and and it, it can only archive itself then through uh, memories, you know? So it has to kind of uh, be forced uh, um, uh, to uh, remind yourself that there is such a thing as an archive, but in a way that's no longer uh, really possible. And who wants to re be reminded, you know, about uh, social media uh, postings you did one year ago? Uh, quite likely, uh, this is uh, rather painful, uh, and you don't want to be reminded uh, about it, uh, and uh, rather uh, move on. So we move away from the framing of new media and the archive. The platform splices together liveness with transactions. Uh, and there's uh, this one uh, very famous phrase that you've encountered already many, many times. Uh, only one room left, right? And then you're there like, oh boy, now we have to do something. There's only one room left. I, I'm looking for something and uh, I need to quickly make uh, a reservation, right? And that's the liveness uh, of the platform. Notification snowball, microscopic customizations aiming to elicit your attention, to make you an offer you can't refuse. Yet, while this surface appears to be an ever-changing, personalized, semiotic spectacle, the platform, like capitalism, is dead inside. According to Mariana Mazzucato, platforms, um, I quote, operate in two-sided markets, developing the supply and, and the, uh, demand sides of the market as a linchpin, a corrector or gatekeeper between them. She con concludes that customers accept being traced uh, and surrendering their personal data, even if ideally they would prefer not to not because they are, uh, have happily embraced the quid pro quo, but out of resignation and frustration, right? So there we are again at the point where I started with this lecture, right? That uh, one of the drivers is kind of, uh, uh, the, of the platforms uh, um, is a situation of resignation uh, and frustration. The platforms that we in, in, inhabit are aspirational media for the users that go there in search of something. I am here. Now, what do I want again? Can you remember this kind of, you, you're on the net, you, but you, you kind of create this, and you was looking for something, but then you forgot, and then you have to remind yourself, okay, but I was looking for something, huh? right? And so you have to really consciously talk to yourself again, like, okay, I, I was trying to purchase something, right? But in the meanwhile, the distraction is such that you are, uh, this is already kind of uh, overwhelmed by uh, so many other uh, impressions and, and offers and, um, uh, you know, uh, things that happen, uh, notifications, somebody else sent you a message, and so on, so on, right? And so this is the, the, the kind of the constant uh, disruption that is happening, that we are all, uh, you know, aware of, and that uh, uh, that we are uh, a part of, maybe we're, uh, ourselves are a victim of it, I'm not really sure if the victim, uh, you know, is, is a really uh, an appropriate uh, way of looking uh, at it. I, n I do not uh, myself see, see myself as a victim necessarily, sp especially because we are actors after all, right? Uh, so uh, 
yeah. So the, there is this, a, a weird uh, dialectic here between us being in charge and us being the victim, right? And this is kind of happening all at the same time. Uh, and yeah, it takes often quite a bit of time to uh, reflect exactly. Uh, and I would really like to invite you, you know, to describe this more in detail because it really helps. Uh, and, you know, if you want to make a, a difference here as a critical media scholar or something like that, uh, the description of these kind of mental states are usually uh, quite, quite helpful. And a lot of people uh, will appreciate it a lot uh, if you take the time to really, really carefully study one tiny aspect of it, even if you don't feel that, okay, this is not really, uh, you know, the big picture. But you need the big picture to describe the, the specific circumstances. And this is still kind of where we are at this very moment in time. We are in a moment when we try to understand and deconstruct, uh, you know, what this, these large cybernetic systems um, are doing to us. Okay, I'll uh, leave it here. Uh, thank you very, very much, and uh, let's uh, open for discussion. Okay. Um, are there any questions already? Great. Yep. All right, let's start. <laughs> Uh, yep. Hello. Uh, what are you proposing for a resolution? Resolution, yeah. Okay, very good. Um, so um, remember, uh, we are in, uh, the psy in psychoanalysis. So um, uh, you ask the last stage of the therapy. Mm -hmm. uh, and <laughs> uh, the, a good Therapist will always uh, um, uh, emphasize that it is very important to first make a diagnosis, mm, then work on, uh, let's say, uh, a, a process of healing, and then uh, look at uh, the resolution as, 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 you know, how to come out. So, uh, in a way, the resolution uh, is very difficult to, to start uh, with, right? If we re reverse it, uh, it, this is becoming uh, really uh, uh, impossible. In the past, of course, I have emphasized uh, this kind of um, dialectics between a critique and alternatives, right? The critique informs the, the need for alternatives and also the critique uh, as a, as a, of course, a very deeply continental uh, European activity of self-reflection, uh, kind of will inform uh, an alternative architecture of the resolution, right? We don't want this, we want that. We don't want, yeah, and so on, right? But first you need to know what you don't want in order to uh, design uh, an alternative. Right now, the question is, uh, you know, um, yeah, where where are we uh, with this with this um, with this uh, kind of the, the dialectic between uh, critique and the development of alternatives? I would say, uh, so you ask for resol the resolution. Um, a resolution, uh, yeah, almost uh, also has some kind of um, maybe even uh, larger, uh, you know, historical uh, dimension, right? It, it's uh, almost, a, a, you know, a reference to, uh, let's say, the Hegelian dialectics uh, in which the totality kind of, uh, you know, requires a moment uh, of... Uh, Enlightened self-reflection in order to to make to make this dialectical jump, if you like, right? And then we can read a lot about that in the, in the critical uh, you know critical theory. 
uh, of, uh, of the early uh, 20th uh, century of the Frankfurt School, etc., etc., right? How we can make this, this uh, kind of dialectical uh, jump. However, um, the, the problem is that, uh, you know, who is the actor here in this, in this process? You know, uh, Hegel and Marx and uh, also the neo, um, uh, let's say, critical theory schools still had an idea of who was going to be the actor in this, in this historical process. But at the moment, we have no, no real idea anymore. Uh, in the neoliberal uh, mindset, uh, we are all individual consumers. Uh, what I can only say is that we cannot expect that uh, the resolution will come from the level of the individual consumer. And we are kind of already uh, you know, arriving at that point because we know that that climate change will not be changed, you know, if we eat a little bit less uh, meat and we, we ha do a little bit more of a vegetarian diet or, uh, you know, go a little bit more on the bicycle and not take the car or something like that, right? Uh, so we are already at that point where we understand that uh, it is not the, 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 the consumer choice that is going to make uh, the difference here. We need another approach, and my uh, answer would be uh, one uh, where at least as a first step, uh, you know, it's necessary to do uh, self-organization. Especially here in Krakow, you know, you have a lot of possibilities to come together, to create groups, and to say, okay, we are going to uh, do uh, al al develop alternatives together. Because uh, in the end, uh, you know, alone... Uh, this will not uh, happen. And alone, you will only uh, kind of, uh, you know, replicate uh, the existing uh, condition. Okay, next. Thank you for your talk. Uh, it was a bit catastrophic yeah. or tragic. And every... Every, ca every catastrophism presupposes something that was destroyed and I would like you to elaborate on this point because if platform media destroyed our attention or make life tragic, there is some idea of proper attention or non-tragic life behind it. And my question is, what's your starting point in this catastrophic speculation? Is this uh, thought that, for example, only proper media is book. It would be like hu humanist idea that the only proper media that reminding human is book and reading and the community of readers and their attention. Or would you, you rather start by some digital utopia of the early internet and collapse of its hopes? And of course, my point will be, or is here presupposed that every such starting idea is deeply problematic if we consider it. And that's one my problem with critical theory, that it often presupposes some ideal in the start. Non-tragic life, proper attention, book readers, and when we look closer at these ideals, they are also problematic. So that's my question for you. Yeah, yeah in that sense, everything is problematic and then nothing will happen, right? And, uh, and then uh, when everything is problematic, uh, you kind of delegate uh, everything that you could do to others, right? So if everything, uh, if every option that you have uh, is already compromised, is already uh, part of the system, or is already, uh, you know, uh, historically uh, problematic, yeah, there's, yeah, you can take a break, you know, uh, yeah, have uh, have some fun, and um, you know, uh, that's all right. But don't um, uh, be upset then that others will take the, that opportunity for you and will dictate ultimately, uh, you know, your own life and the circumstances because you uh, have delegated this opportunity uh, to, to others and you, you said, okay, the, everything that I w can do, all the possibilities that I think, you know, are already co-opted, 
are um, you know um, are uh, problematic. Uh, so why why try? Why why think? Right? Yeah. And and then yeah, in a way, uh, you know, life stops because yeah, there you 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 don't have any more options because literally every choice you make uh, will be problematic in the end, right? And it's not just the alternatives that I offer that will be problematic, but in the end, all possibilities will be problematic, right? And and so then, uh, you know, there is no uh, possibility for you, let alone for if you come together and create, uh, let's say, uh, or larger structures um, to, to make a difference, right? Uh, so, yeah, I, 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 I like your position, right? But it also means that you're out. You're you're no longer, you know, a player. Hmm? Hmm? Yeah, but uh, the ca the catastrophe is not, uh, you know, that uh, is not the let's say the given. Uh, the catastrophe only obviously only comes at the very end of a, of a uh, of a development right and in this case uh, the develop the development of the internet took uh, you know 40 years at least right so um, the catastrophe was not uh, you know uh, included in 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 it from the very beginning right? in the beginning it was a military uh, network then it became a scientific network then uh, it became, uh, you know, a public network owned by uh, universities, and then it was given to the market, uh, the, in particular the telecom uh, market. And then after the telecom market, uh, yeah, we started to see uh, these these platforms uh, arising, and uh, that whole development uh, took uh, took 40 years. So it it is not a, a given. Uh, how things start in in, in which uh, way uh, they um, they develop. Thank you. Next, next question. So the catastrophe, you know, comes at the very end. It's not uh, you know, a catastrophic from the beginning. When when you use the perspective of um, therapy, especially mentioning the twelve uh, steps, which they can be sometimes controversial, uh, but that's another topic. Um, and if the therapy should be, um, when we want to be um, a su successful client or patient or uh, a participant of a therapy, um, there's a meeting point where uh, a person realize that uh, he, she is a victim. And you mentioned that the perspective of being victim is not what you like. Why? Well, at least, uh, you know, there's a mixed feeling about the victim because uh, we are uh, all the time uh, also uh, in charge ourselves. And this is, this is the problem. Huh? Um, the, the victim position uh, is something that uh, comes at the very end, and it's not something, you know, um, uh, we we cannot say that we have become victim of Facebook, right? This is not. Um, uh, we we have been active there. We met a lot of uh, friends and and family, and uh, we took part in a lot of uh, things. We liked a lot of things and uh, followed and uh, right. So there's an but enormous still, that's uh, complex, a relation uh, which is active uh, and social activity happening yeah. there, uh, and uh, so uh, the, the the victim position uh, is only something uh, that we construct, reconstruct almost uh, uh, later, or at least it's also something to a large extent that uh, we are uh, not aware of directly because. Um, the choices that uh, we're confronted with are often either subliminal or, uh, you know, the, they are driven by advertisement and algorithmic choices that we cannot really uh, understand because uh, the technology is quite uh, complex, right? 
so this and this is this is the problem uh, that a straight out um, victimization uh, is not uh, is not uh, really really possible and can only be you know constructed uh, and will be also very often uh, be subliminal and and so this is the this is the problem it's it's a, it's a series of ongoing uh, kind of micro decisions are yeah in which even the micro decisions it's questionable whether we make those decisions uh, ourselves. So that's just a comment, not a question, but maybe the emancipation of a victim, uh, that's a part of a healing process if we have the catastrophe and uh, really uh, the end. Maybe that's the kind of uh, something to just reflect. Thank you. Anyone? Uh, next question. Yeah, here. Uh, okay. Yeah, and there. Yeah. Thank you for your talk. Um, and my question is rather simple. Um, I have taken a note that you mentioned that, uh, well, the difference between, say, the generation of people in the 90s involved in creating the internet uh, and the current generation is that. Uh, it's now, uh, uh, you were obsessed with a database, an archive, and now it's all constant streaming and uh, never-ending change, right? Yeah. So Correct. who would like to uh, remember something that a post uh, that was posted a year ago, right? On the, on the other hand, there is this saying that the internet never forgets, and whatever you post never disappears. So how can you, could, would you like to comment yeah, on this, Yeah, please? sure. No, I, th I think the, the whole idea, the trope that the internet uh, never forgets is really from a long time ago. And um, um, this is, a, yeah, in a way, uh, it is true if you only look at it from the perspective of the NSA, let's say, or uh, from the perspective of, uh, you know, the Chinese Communist Party that uh, extracts an enormous uh, amount of data from its 1.4 uh, you know billion citizens uh, that uh, uh, are forced via uh, commercial uh, uh, players like Tencent, WeChat, etc., to uh, submit uh, you know uh, the, the, the the data. So ultimately, then uh, there is a, a larger uh, let's say meta uh, controlling agency. In this case, the NSA or uh, the, the Chinese Communist Party that forgets. And it's not per se the internet uh, itself that forgets. The internet, uh, I want to remind you, uh, you know, if you go to a, a, a 90s um, a website like Internet Archive, you will see that uh, there uh, it's very clearly stated that it's completely impossible uh, for, for this, uh, you know, non-profit uh, organization uh, to uh, to store uh, the data of the social media platforms. So so the Internet Archive is already in in a way everything that is excluded out is outside of the social media platforms. On top of that, you, we have to reconcile with the fact that over eighty percent, eighty two percent at the moment. Uh, of all the internet traffic is streaming media and mainly uh, video platforms, meaning um, you know Disney Plus, um, uh, Netflix, uh, and then uh, you know uh, HBO uh, and all the other platforms. So, and then a small percentage of that uh, is a website which is called YouTube, right? So YouTube itself is a very small part of uh, the 82 percent and of that 82 percent of streaming media nothing is archived right literally zero mm -hmm. so uh, so we are talking about the archiving of the internet that is actually already only 18 percent and of that you have to take off the social media so you know, so the actual internet archive is only a very few percentages, uh, and that yeah in itself 
uh, is interesting and you know it's it's fascinating and still very very large of course and uh, if you talk to the people from uh, the internet archive uh, they will tell you that even if they <laughs> Uh, you know, archive three <laughs> uh, percent. It's a it's a monumental task uh, uh, to uh, to do. So yeah, so that that is uh, the Internet Archive uh, today. Okay. Yep. Um, at the beginning of your speech, you um, talked about uh, the immigration of people from Twitter to another like mm -hmm. platform and. That for me is like, okay, if some people do this, you know, kind of massive immigration, something can change. <clears throat> but in a way, um, I don't know, do you have some examples of like effective behavior that like if a lot of users and uh, I don't know, people uh, co connect together and can make a difference? Because uh, in my mind, uh, the, yeah. the bigger opponents to yeah. this, you know, big corporations that collect data are just... Yeah. Hackers or <laughs> illegal, you know. And I yeah, know. one of, for sure because there is there's a, a, an, an example that, that you all know are, are very well aware of, and that is the rise of uh, new generations. And new generations are very very difficult uh, to control in that sense, right? And uh, Silicon Valley has tried a lot. You know, they put an enormous amount of pressure, political pressure, on Trump to forbid uh, TikTok in America. Uh, they didn't succeed. And uh, now, uh, you know, we are faced with this uh, uh, situation that uh, a lot of the young people, they, uh, they, they didn't even want to go on Facebook, right? Uh, instead, uh, they kind of immediately uh, went on uh, TikTok or uh, migrated from Instagram to TikTok. Right or still have the the two options, but mostly. I mean, how many of you here are using TikTok? How many? Many? Uh, not so many. No, it's not very popular in Poland. No, huh? huh? I doubt. <laughs> huh? It is right. Yeah, it is. So you know. So uh, in that sense, uh, but uh, obviously the new generation didn't have to migrate. Right, they didn't have to organize an exodus. No, they just started. They were 16, 15, maybe 14, and yeah, the moment they were uh, uh, able to to join and got a phone, etc., they went on TikTok. Right. So in that sense, uh, big uh, big changes uh, can still be uh, expected from, uh, let's say, younger generations. Especially uh, today, of course, a lot of people are looking at uh, you know, what is called uh, Gen Z. And um, uh, that is, uh, for, for internet um, watchers and uh, people who study platforms, uh, is still, uh, an, by and large, unknown uh, factor. What, what's going to happen um, with the behavior uh, of this uh, upcoming uh, generation? Um, but my, uh, because in this case, uh, the younger generations are clueless about their movement on this new platform because for them may might be the first one. But if like a group of person wants, you know, to take an action and make something, do you have like some, I don't know, examples that ec effectively have uh, kind of like, I don't know, an improvement and uh, I don't know, also about activism, is it still possible to do this? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, that's a question we have to ask ourselves. You know, here, here in Poland, here in Krakow, we need to, uh, you know, here in Europe, we need to ask ourselves, really. You know, do we have uh, viable alternatives? Can we uh, create other networks, new forms of self-organization that, uh, you know, are not part of this uh, platform madness, hmm? and and if so, uh, you know, uh, if they are not there, uh, you know, maybe you will be able to organize it. You know, we also should uh, be optimistic, and because I am very optimistic about you know young people in Europe being able to organize uh, themselves, and I don't see why, you know, we have to say okay, 
the only uh, destiny they have uh, will be, uh, you know, to be uh, slaves of some Chinese app. No, why? Why? That's not uh, necessary, right? Uh, so, uh, but yeah, in a way that will also depend on us here in this room uh, if we create um, alternatives. And by the way, this is not rocket science, right? It's not so difficult. It's not so difficult, uh, you know. It's just, do we, do we read uh, the sign of the times? Do we understand, uh, you know, what is, uh, what is required? And then, uh, you know, to build, to build something, to build the tools, you know, it, it's not, uh, not too hard, really. Uh, it's just a matter of, uh, you know, are we, are we willing to take that step? And we cannot, again, I want to express that, we cannot do that on our own. This is impossible. This is, um, yeah, if you think that only individual kind of consumer behavior will change something, well, uh, good luck. I, I, I don't think that that's going to happen. That will not be the way out. Thank you. We have yeah, already uh, hit yeah. one hour and a half. Okay, thank you. So I think we can, mm -hmm. but the discussion is not over by no, any means. No, 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 because, because we, we have are meeting a tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow at, and uh, Wednesday. 3 p.m. on yeah. uh, Berka Joselewicza 23A. Mm -hmm. uh, and this will be yeah. the first part of the workshops we've planned and the jam, the media jam. Also at 3 p.m. on Wednesday at Scena Supernova. Yeah. And thank you so much for coming. Uh, I'm very happy.